Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Sam, thanks for having me. Great to spend time with you and Lara, Vikram, Vishal, and the team, and our many, many clients. Um, I, I'm actually slightly younger than Sam and Shantanu, but not by much. But So I will also add a bit of historical uh, perspective. And I've found that when times are really changing, it's important to go back to fundamentals and never leave sight of them. And when I think about media planning and buying, which is the center of Madison's business, it can most easily be described as the process of budget allocation between channels, the optimization of investment within channels, and the process of attributing effectiveness across those channels. That's what we do. And it's a function that's remained unaltered in its purpose for as long as I can remember in my 30-something years in the business. And of course, it's important because it represents the stewardship of one of the biggest cost line items in the near universal marketer pursuit of predictable, profitable growth. Because predictable, profitable growth is, after all, the perennial source of stockholder return, management incentives, and in many of our cases, continuity of employment. So it's unaltered in principle, but not in education, in execution. If you take the long view of advertising and brand marketing, you can observe three distinct e epochs. The time before television, the broadcast age, and the on-demand era. And for easing of framing in the US context, these eras lasted until 1950 in the US when TV reached 50% penetration and the broadcast age from 1950 to 2010, in which TV dominated all forms of communication and culture, and now since 2010, the on-demand area, at which point broadband passed 50% in the United States. And who knows how long that will last. Perhaps the decade of the metaverse will always be a decade away, or the decade of artificial intelligence has arrived with a bang. The passing of each of these epochs represents tectonic change for marketers and inevitable disruption in sector after sector. From a time of dominance of local brands in history and businesses to the proliferation of national and international brands, aided by an abundance of reach and attention, to the current atomization of both audiences and attention, and the intended removal in many categories, in media and elsewhere, to barriers of entry. It's likely that media companies, marketers, and their agencies were at their happiest in the broadcast age. It was a time, if you like, of well-organized oligopolies. Just the right number of channels, the right number of retailers, the right number of manufacturers in every category. Planning was simple, and outcomes were largely predictable. So as long as you were in the club, it was a very good club to be in indeed. What the broadcast age allowed us to do was build models of efficiency and effectiveness and determine media truths in every category we worked with. We knew how to open a movie. We knew how to maximize store traffic, how to launch a new line, how to optimize reach curves, how to deliver exact frequency, and by and large, solve the famous Wanamaker problem of which half of my advertising worked. It was a period of great certainty, and specifically certainty in the relationship between the buyers and sellers of advertising, or at least a shared acceptance of and an allowance for its faults and failings. We knew how many people watched a show. We aimed off a bit for wonky samples and bathroom visits. We knew how many people bought, received, or read a magazine, and we had no fear of the atrocious adjacency as a structural risk to brand reputation. We lived in a world in which we were comfortable with being approximately right most of the time. We were comfortable in a world where spending $5 million on a Super Bowl ad only needed four people, the buyer, the seller, and the two caddies to carry the golf clubs. In an old-fashioned construction, everyone knew where they stood, or at least they thought they did, and that perception was everything. But the broadband era changed everything. Its boosters, of which I was absolutely one, claimed that the old ways were wasteful and unaccountable, that the new ways were precise in terms of audience delivery, in terms of efficient in the elimination of waste, and effective in deriving in performance when it mattered. We not you, dealt in a world of facts, not faith. 
Best of all, we dealt in perfect attribution, tying the advertising input to the business effect. Search marketing took that certainty to a whole new level. You didn't even have to pay until someone clicked on your ad. Advertising had finally found its place on the cost of good line on the P&L, and not just some variable general and admin cost, one chilly quarter away from, the cut, from, from a cut. That wasn't the end of the accounting metaphors of the on-demand era, as one advertiser after another committed resources to the Facebook friends arm race, they did so in the conviction that they were creating a balance sheet asset that allowed them to create a permanently addressable cohort of customers and prospects for maximum lifetime value and minimum lifetime costs. And as many of you will know if you participated in that, that did not end well. Yet, search and social swallowed advertising almost completely in the on-demand age. Consumer attention significance uh, shifted significantly, and advertiser dollars shifted seismically. Business models that advertisers relied upon for several generations were undermined. Cords were cut, or more accurately, boxes were discarded. Magazine and newspaper sales collapsed as the media that they represented became unbundled. What was less obvious during that time, and not even a talking point to 2015, was that advertisers and agencies had begun trading in a commodity that in truth they barely understood. This lack of transparency was manifested in four areas. The area of brand safety, social safety, more important still, transparency and measurement. And this compromised the media planning and buying process because with such uncertainty, how do I use inventory if I don't understand it? It's an allocation problem. How do I optimize in formats and for outcomes that are different and hard to quantify? And is last click attribution to an ad that may not even have been seen an adequate way to steward budgets? And of course, they're all symptoms of a wider malaise. In simpler times, the advertiser knew where he stood. If he bought a back cover of Vogue, every copy on every newsstand would have that ad. If they bought time on television, they could tune in and see it. The speed with which those simple principles broke down in the on-demand age was breathtaking, and advertisers suddenly went from trading in the known to the unknown. I would recommend all of you to follow an Oxford University professor whose name is Rachel Botsman. She has built the first course on trust in the digital world at the Said Business School at Oxford University. She's more than worth your time. I encountered her the first time about four years ago at an event that was run by Sky, now part of Comcast, in which she defined trust as having a confident relationship with the unknown. I thought that was very powerful, and I've carried that thought with me ever since. The implication is that we're unlikely to trust what we do not know, unless something or someone gives us the confidence to do so. A loss of trust is, by extension, a loss of confidence. So trust in things can be built by a confidence in people, and our loss of trust in things can lose us to lose trust in people. It's a relative concept rather than an absolute one. Most often, trust and confidence relate to the size of the consequences or the reward in question. So this has a lot of consequences. If you have no confidence, you tend to make suboptimal decisions. You often invest or coalesce around measures that seem to make sense, but often just create false incentives and often create rules that have unintended consequences. All of clicks, last click attribution, viewability and brand safety have created issues that have diverted the industry's time and attention from making advertising a positive force in business, which I define as a productive three-sided contract between consumers, creators, and advertisers. 2024 is firmly in gear, and you might be forgiven for thinking that we're approaching peak distrust. There's distrust in politics, there's distrust in institutions, in enterprises, in the media, and in many cases, distrust in each other. And the rise of AI, and with it, more sophisticated botnets and deep fakes won't do much to help trust. So herein lies the value of businesses like Madison. 
Madison is part of both the trust and innovation ecosystems. It works with an ever-changing rotor of suppliers and partners that allow its clients to test new opportunities and transact with a degree of confidence in commodities that lack the intrinsic transparency and tangibility of television and print. Madison and its peers, and I think about this from a community point of view and an industry point of view, have an important function. We have to protect advertisers from fraud and appalling context, but we also have to protect publishers and more broadly creators from demonetization and consumers from disinformation. And we have to use the tools that are now available to us as scalpels and not blunt instruments. The effect on the news industry of brand safety tools in the digital world has been almost tragic. To Shantanu's point, never has it been more important to choose your pur purpose and to choose your partners with care. There are minimum standards in business today that are important. And that standard is that the business works constantly to reduce the environmental and social cost of your operations. It's a totally different idea from the notion of do no evil because it's impossible to operate a business without any consequence at all. But my own view is that the idea of always progressing, always being better, always taking more responsibility, always building trust is a very effective way to run a business. It allows you to think about doing good and being good as a journey. It allows you to create scorecards around diversity, around inclusion, around sustainability and purpose, and to organize improving those scorecards over time. What these scorecards should do is touch every aspect of the operations of the business, and that includes media and advertising. So when we deploy AI to develop creative assets, we should do them to reflect the cultural mosaic and values of our audiences. When we allocate budgets, we should do it in ways that consider the ownership of media and the implications that those media have for the world. We should be willing to hold our media partners accountable for the content they produce or enable. And we should consider media and data choices through the prism of sustainability and privacy. It's easy to think about all of this as more work, but I think it's a responsibility. We've got an opportunity to respond to changes in society and be great participants. There is increased awareness of social impact, and we, because we affect culture, need to be a leader rather than the follower. We've got a collective responsibility to do more for less and to consider value received relative to both economic and social costs. So for Madison, future success means addressing the issues of the day in partnership with our clients, in partnerships with our seller community, in partnership with our competitor, and in partnership with the media uh, businesses that cover our industry. And I think what we need to think about collectively to make our business better, and for the third time today, these accurate cross-reach media and frequency tools, a meaningful way to understand ad impact equivalents across media, commerce, and communication platforms, and ways of assessing customer journeys in a world where influence is widely distributed and those journeys are never linear. We need to find identity and contextual solutions in a post-cookie world that thread the needle between consumer privacy and advertiser utility. And we need to collect and deploy first-party data, including that data volunteered by the consumer, and data known and exclusive to advertisers. Persuading the CFOs that have great influence over the investment in advertising is a very difficult thing to do, but it's easier to persuade them of that investment if we capture the opportunity by being proactive on working to attribute effect, manage risk, and re-establish trust in all that we do. Thank you.